for a few words before we read the section of scripture. Uh, first of all, you will not find baby Jesus in these verses. So in case you are sort of getting ready to listen to a sermon on um, the Lord Jesus Christ in a manger, that will not happen. Let me say one or two words as to how come I have landed in Daniel and chapter 4. Well, first of all, it's simply the fact that it is my habit when I am preaching from the New Testament in one service to also have another message from the Old Testament. But secondly, this morning, if you were here, you will recall that uh, we, we had a message about love and joy. We concentrated on the, the, the joyful aspect of uh, what life ought to be, especially life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it's uh, quite true that that's the atmosphere with which we often paint uh, the season of Christmas. It's a time of joy, a time of celebration, a time of exchanging gifts, it's a time of love. Uh, there is truth to be said about that. But it is equally true, as we've already been hearing every so often at the beginning of this service, that in the midst of all that mirth and joy and celebration, there's often the reality of sadness and loneliness. There are a lot of individuals who, while others are celebrating, in their case, it's a period of pain. And it's important when we uh, come to the house of the Lord that we do not just get carried away with one aspect of life, but that we take cognizance of the fact that our God is an all-embracing God. His ministry reaches all of us in the different situations in which we find ourselves. And so I felt it quite appropriate that I should include in today's ministration from God's word that other aspect, the, what I am calling here where, when, when God disturbs our peace, when all seems to be well and somehow God comes in and brings the entire superstructure crumbling down at our feet. How do we handle that? And especially, what does it show concerning true faith in our hearts? So I will ask us then to read verse 1 all the way to verse 8. Verse 1 to verse 8 of Daniel and chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might, be, they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. And then that last verse, at last, Daniel came in before me. 
he who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, and from that point, we have the dream being told to um, Belteshazzar, or as we prefer to call him, to Daniel. What we have in this passage of scripture is an experience that all of us at one stage or another go through. And it's the experience of movement from a, a time of peace and tranquility, joy and celebration, and then suddenly unprepared, we find ourselves in a situation where we are almost despairing. We are in a period either of frustration or a period of alarm. And so the experience of Nebuchadnezzar here is one that all of us can identify with. And often it is God who comes knocking in our lives. It is God who wants to, to as it were, bring out of our hearts what is truly there. And no doubt about it, it was a testing time for Nebuchadnezzar himself. And one of the realities that we soon come across with respect to Nebuchadnezzar was the superficiality of his own faith. Looking back, we, we have at least two events that were already taking place in the life of Nebuchadnezzar that would have given us the impression that this man was now converted. In fact, recently I was uh, listening to a sermon by a, a famous preacher, I can't even quite recall who it was, but what disturbed me was when he was expounding uh, Daniel chapter 2, and as he came to the end of Daniel chapter 2, he spoke of uh, Nebuchadnezzar as being converted. Now clearly, as we shall see in chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, he was not converted. He had definitely undergone religious experience. And the religious experience had caused him to own something concerning the God of Daniel. But his heart was still unconverted. So what we're learning from here is that not every acknowledgement of God is a proof of a converted heart. However sound that acknowledgement might be. Look with me quickly at the first three verses of Daniel chapter 4. And what we see here is Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging the greatness, the power, and the eternity of the true God of heaven. These are words which he himself wrote. We read King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. And this is what he says. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. This most high God is not his God with a small g. He is referring to the God of Israel, the God of Daniel. And he is saying, this God has done something for me, and I want to testify of it to you. Now, why is that? It is because he has been overwhelmed by what he is calling here signs and wonders. I want to show the signs and wonders that the Most High has done for me. Two such situations have recently occurred. The first 
was when he had this dream that kept coming a number of times and it really worried him to the point where he called his enchanters, his astrologers, and without telling them the content of the dream, which is what you find in chapter 2, he wanted them not only to tell him the content, but also the interpretation. They failed miserably. He came to the point where he decided, I'm going to kill the whole shoot of you. And if you know anything about these tyrants in these days, that was not an empty threat. Word got to Daniel. Daniel got his friends to pray and in due season, God revealed both the dream and the interpretation to Daniel. So when he came before Nebuchadnezzar and shared all these things to him, Nebuchadnezzar's response is what we find at the end of chapter 2. Let's quickly turn there. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. So clearly, already at that point, he was shaken to the very core of his being by the realization that there is a God who is able to reveal things without me revealing them. And not only that, to even know the interpretation thereof. Well, the proof that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar was not converted was that as we enter into chapter 3, he makes an idol, a huge idol. And he demands that all men everywhere should come and bow down to it. Well, it is that situation that brings about another sign and wonder. And it is when the children of Israel, especially the three friends of Daniel, refused to bow to this idol. And in the midst of that, Nebuchadnezzar is enraged. And he demands that they should be burnt immediately. Well, the people that were throwing them into the fire, as you know, got destroyed in the process but the three friends of Daniel survived the situation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire. They did not burn. And so in due season, Nebuchadnezzar got them out. And the result of this is what we are now reading here. Nebuchadnezzar is once again shaken to the core of his being. He says in chapter 3 and verse 28... Chapter 3 and verse 28, we read, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. And as a result of this, he demands that everyone everywhere should worship this God. He's moved by religious experience to acknowledge the reality of this God. And therefore, he says in chapter 4, verse 3, How great are his signs! How mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. For many of us, we would immediately say, Brother Nebuchadnezzar, what other proof do you want? He must be saved. Not so with God. 
God who sees the human heart knew that this man still needed to be humbled. And the humbling is going to come in the fourth chapter. Nebuchadnezzar was not yet converted. He was still full of himself. What he had done previously when he put up that idol, he continued to do in his heart. In his heart, he was still idolatrous. And the primary idol that he was worshipping was himself. That's the trouble. And God knew all that. Therefore, friends, let me suggest to you that you can go very far in religious experience without necessarily being converted to Christ. You can. And often it's because of the circumstances that God brings about in your life that cause you, if I may say, force you to acknowledge that there is a God in heaven. And you may even want to testify of him publicly, as Nebuchadnezzar did here. You can go that far and still be unconverted. How do we know what is happening in our hearts? Well, it is when God comes to knock on our lives. Especially when he brings about what we call a frowning providence. A situation that causes us to be filled with anxiety and fear. The question is, where do we run to? Look at Nebuchadnezzar. First of all, he was in a period of tranquility. He tells us himself in the fourth verse, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. He was at this stage the greatest king in the known world. Babylon had defeated all its previous enemies. It was now the most powerful empire. And therefore, if there was one place that was the most secure place on the planet at that time, it was in Babylon. It was in the palace of Babylon, the king's palace, and it was in the master bedroom in that palace. Because the king knows that in that place I must sleep. I need to make sure it's absolutely secure. And so when this man says that I was at ease in my house, prosperous in my palace, you can imagine him saying to himself, we have it made. As one New Testament person said, eat, drink, and be merry. Satisfy your soul with good things. That's what he thought. But God, in the midst of all that security, comes knocking. And how does he do this? Can you imagine? He does it through a dream. I mean, the one place that burglar bars cannot protect. Your dreams. And that's where God breaks through. He's got the most powerful army outside his bedroom and all kinds of bars to protect him in the most powerful nation. And God comes through his dreams and knocks. Verse 5. I saw a dream that made me afraid. 
As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. He was at his wit's end. Despite the peace, the tranquility, and the prosperity he was speaking about earlier. What are we learning from this? Ultimately, there, there is no place on this earth where you can get away from God, where God cannot catch up with you. There isn't. A lot of people run away from Africa, professionals, and make their way to Europe, and America. I remember my son when we came to America a few years ago, I, I, when I wrote to him saying, would you like to accompany me to the US? His reply was a very simple answer. He said, America, the land of the brave and the free? Of course! Who can say no to such an invitation? And we came together and in due season, we went back home together. The point I'm trying to make is, there is a certain sense in which individuals who are in prosperous countries tend to be of the opinion that this is now safe. We are away from the Al-Shababs and the Boko Harams of this world. We are away from the effects of the uh, Islamic terrorists who are decimating the, the nation of Syria. We're very far away. We, we are secure. And when you see their pictures, especially in adverts and in, in Hollywood movies and in religious television that is piped across the ocean. You can almost believe that. But that's a lie. There is no safe place on this planet. You now enter into the individual lives. Individual lives. In Europe. In America. And you find lives in which God has come knocking. Lives that are full of loneliness. Lives that have failed to handle the effect of disease, of climate change. Lives that have failed to handle the reality of death that has come visiting them. Lives that have failed to handle the reality of wayward children, children that are addicted to alcohol and drugs. Lives that have come crumbling down in the midst of plenty, crumbling down. And I often discover this, especially with respect to social media, you, you find that there are always people there who are smiling, always smiling, having fun, everything is exciting. Until you get close enough and you discover there is heartache and pain in that situation. God comes knocking. And this comes to all of us, whether we are Christians or not. Frowning providence will come in one form or another. It will not always be Christmas, if you know what I mean. It will not always be a festive season. With every mountain climb, there will be a descent into the valley. Soon after spring, you are going to experience your winter. God comes knocking. And you see, 
the folly of the non-Christian world is the failure to recognize this reality. That life on earth will have its four seasons. It doesn't matter whether today you are experiencing praises from people, promotion to the highest office, and whatever else it might be. Tomorrow there will be the cry, crucify him, crucify him. That is life. Has God come knocking on your life? Has it? As you are entering this year's Christmas, are you an individual currently experiencing something of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar here? Fear? Alarm? Wondering whether you will survive the current trial. Life is like that. Job, the most prosperous individual in the early world. One moment, servant after servant, begin to come in with bad news. Until the man just tears his cloth and sits in ashes, especially when his own health even gives way. Life is like that. And often it is when those challenges come that we begin to see what's really happening inside us. Is this religion real? Or is it skin deep? With respect to Nebuchadnezzar, it was definitely skin deep. Because when it, your religion is skin deep, the one place you rush to when God knocks on your little life is the arm of flesh. You go to the world. You appeal to your own fallen sinful nature. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did here. And that's what gave him away that this religion was not true faith in the living God. What does he do? Well, very quickly, verse 6. So, he says, I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, they might make known to me the interpretation of the dreams. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. Now you'll say, now hang on. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, hang on. I mean, these guys have failed you before. <laughs> Remember, you had brought them in before. They couldn't. So why bring them back again? But that's what he did. He brought them all in and they miserably failed. He even went so far as to give them the, inter the, the dream itself. Previously he did it, but on this occasion he does so. He says to them, guys, this is what I dreamt. Give me the interpretation. And thankfully, they have enough integrity on this occasion to be able to say to him, sir, we can't. We have failed. Let's face it. One of the unquestionable evidence, evidences that you don't know, you have not experienced 
true faith in Christ is when frowning providence comes into your life. Here's the question. Where do you go? Where do you go? Sadly, we often go to the very people who themselves are already failures. They failed. But that's where we rush to. Because we want to listen to what we want to listen to. And so we bundle ourselves with people who ultimately will not do us any lasting good. It's amazing. Back home in Zambia, my own congregation comprises largely young adults, individuals that have got married perhaps in the last five to ten years at the most 15 years and often when individuals backslide and they are going through a crisis whether it is at work or in the marriage or in the family it just amazes me where they go to for help here they have church elders whose lives show godly fruit in the marriage, in the family, in the way in which they've handled by the grace of God, the bombs that have exploded in their lives before. They don't go there. Instead, they rush to relatives. Relatives who are already biased against their spouses. They rush to friends. Friends who will not speak to them without fear or favor. And often, it simply points to the spiritual malady which is there in their soul. The spiritual decay which is already there. Those who are genuine and they are walking with the Lord do what Nebuchadnezzar did at last. And we'll come to that in a moment. But they do it at first. They immediately go to those who love God and who love his word. And they say, this is the alarm. This is what has happened in my life. Pray with me. Come alongside me. Help me. Knowing that they will hear the mind of God. Let me ask. In the trials in your life. When God knocks in your life. Where do you go? Where do you go? When it disturbs your peace, suddenly things are falling apart. Where do you rush to? The secular psychologist? Is that where you go to? Well, very quickly, Daniel was brought in in the eighth verse. And from the eighth verse, all the way to the end of chapter 4, Daniel diagnoses the situation. And sure enough, Nebuchadnezzar undergoes a serious period of humiliation. Basically, if I could summarize for you, and then we will conclude, Daniel's answer to this was, look, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, God knows that you are full of pride. And this pride is leading you astray. And consequently, a time is going to come when he is going to humiliate you. 
really humble you. Thankfully, you will learn the lesson well and come to your senses and he will restore you. Let me generalize that for a moment. What Daniel said was this. Nebuchadnezzar, you are still in sin. There is sin in your life. God is bringing a trial in your life for your spiritual good. Thankfully, you will respond to that trial in the right way. And the right way is this. Repentance. 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 And when you repent, he will bless you. Now friends, I could say that in literally any situation. God brings trials in our lives not to destroy us, but in order to burn the dross of vain desire to purify us, to make us more godly, and assuming we are not converted, it is in order that we might come to repentance and faith and consequently get saved. There is a moral government over this universe. Things don't just happen haphazardly. There is an intelligent being who governs the universe. And he leads it with intricate insight. With infinite wisdom in individual lives. Bring us to that point where ultimately he must be glorified. Now here's the point. The reason why unbelieving counselors fail is because they don't bring into the picture this organizing principle. They don't. They don't. They won't come to you as you are seeking their counsel and say to you, have you searched your own heart? Have you? Could there be some sin in your life that the Lord wants to deal with? Could there be some idol that God might be wanting to deal with? Not that we're judging you, we're simply asking that you search yourself. After all, Daniel had the gift of prophecy. We don't. And to be able to say the Lord of heaven is a gracious God. He takes you through a trial, but just enough. Never more. Because he doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to bring you out on the opposite end, purer than gold. The non-Christian counselor doesn't say that. And therefore, they medicate symptoms. All they will do is tell you, well, that person is bad. Your boss is bad. Well, you know, we've got a bad government and, and it's just bad weather and it's, it's bad everything else. And in the end, we do not submit our souls before God that God may deal graciously with us. That was the failure of these counselors. And that's the failure of the many counselors we got. Oh, that God may give us the humility when he disturbs our peace for us to go back to him. To go to godly men and women. To, to pour before them our fears. That which has alarmed us. The loss of peace and tranquility and joy in our circumstances. 
And to borrow this picture, I know exactly where they will point you. To the foot of the cross. To the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Through whom our sins are washed away. They will remind us that the God in heaven is a loving heavenly father. Who means well with us. That when we have gone through the furnace of affliction. We will come out purer than gold. He will simply enable us. To minister to others. With the same degree that he has ministered to us. Through our experience. And consequently. We will have a well beaten path to the cross. And that's what I want to say to you as I close. In case this Christmas that's what you're going through. A period of trial. Your peace. Your joy has come crumbling down at your feet. My appeal is Stop going to the worldly for counsel. Stop it. In the end, you will be the loser. Go to the godly. Go to God's word. Go to God himself in prayer. Submit your life to him. And see what he will do with your life. He is a God who rejoices in doing good. He will do that good for you in due season. Let's pray together.